Before I begin, I'd like to thank my co-authors Karen and Don, and especially their patient and her mom for their parts in this presentation. Rob Lindsay for determining the stiffness of the Energy Storage and Return, or ESR AFO. Sue Redekop of the Blurview Gate Lab for getting us the results in record time. And OAPO for their funding support. There's an increasing number of orthotic studies showing AFOs with ESR capabilities in both spina bif and cerebral palsy populations. But they're all based on carbon fiber designs, walking, and in labs that are outside of Canada. At last year's ISPO convention, the results of an adult with Guillain-Barré syndrome was presented, which demonstrated that ESR AFOs were able to improve ankle kinetics better than her previous thermoplastic ankle foot orthoses, without adversely affecting her hip or her knee. In this study, a 14-year-old with low-level spina bifida was studied and compared to normal and shoes-only conditions. At a self-selected walking speed, similar findings were seen at the ankle as in the previous ESR gait lab. But in this case, marked improvements in the knee profiles were also observed. EMG confirmed that the changes were a direct result of the ESR AFOs. In the shoes only condition, you can see that the ankle passively extends throughout the stance phase and that the joint is largely flail, as shown here in the moment curve. And this results in what I would consider a fairly flat power curve. If we compare that now to the ESR AFOs, there's a significantly improved power curve due in part by improved ankle motion, and that's again the blue and the purple curves showing a, a more normal profile and a bit of plantar flexion occurring actually during stance phase. But the biggest reason the power is improved is because of this near normal ankle moment. And again, green and the red are the shoes only, blue and the purple would be with her wearing the ESR AFOs. And you can see that they fall within the normal variability uh, for that age population. EMG confirms that this cannot be attributed to increased muscle activity. And peak powers improve from 4% in the shoes condition up to 30% of normal in the ESR AFO. What's comforting is that this reinforces the uh, results previously presented in the other ESR gait lab. When we consider the knee and in the shoes only condition, you can see that there's a significantly increased torque demand placed on um, her knees in the shoes only condition because of the flail ankle and the crouched posture, which I'm sure you uh, saw in the video. When we compare that to the ESR AFOs, you can see that there's a significant improvement in the knee moment. And that's largely attributed to the more erect posture and the push-off contribution of the ESR AFO. And again, confirmed with EMG that there is no increased knee extensor activity. And in fact, it was less than the unbraced condition. And I think this has fairly significant immediate impacts, but obviously long-term benefits to not place that kind of a demand on the knees of our patients. So why do another gait lab? Well, obviously we'd like to build on the database. We'd like to try a different patient population. And in this case, like to study running as well as walking conditions. If nothing else, I want you to consider that most of the individuals we treat do much more than walk in straight lines on level ground and the ESR orthoses have the ability to make it a little easier for them to become more active without having to pay as much for it at other joints now or down the road. I'm not aware of any published orthotic running research and hopefully that will change, but in prosthetic studies, all prosthetic feet have near normal ankle moments, but ESR devices are the ones that will have the best ankle powers and the least hip and knee compensations. I'd like to review the incidences and phases of normal gait Initial contact defines the beginning and the end of the gait cycle. For running, that's still the heel touching the ground first, and for sprinting, that's when you go up onto your toes. Toe-off usually occurs around 40% of the gait cycle. If you're increasing your velocity, that will, stance time drops down. And there's two other incidences I have to introduce, and that is stance and swing phase reversal. Uh, stance phase reversal occurs in the middle of the stance phase and it's a point where the body center of mass is at its lowest and its slowest. So that corresponds to minimal potential and kinetic energies and the flip of that would be in the middle of swing phase which is swing phase reversal which is when the body center of mass would be at its highest and its fastest. So that would result in maximal potential and kinetic energy. Just as an aside, that's 
very different than walking. Walking, you think of an inverted pendulum where you have a sinusoidal but inverse relationship with potential and kinetic energy. And running, they go together. Huger, much more higher energy costs, but because of that, that sinking of the potential and kinetic energies, uh, we can split the running gait cycle up into an absorption and a generation phase. So absorption uh, takes place from stance phase, sorry, swing phase reversal through initial contact into stance phase reversal. Or another way of looking at it is absorption occurs in the second half of swing and the first half of stance, and then that flips around so that for the second half of stance and the first half of swing, you have the power generation phase. Some of the differences you'll see between the subject and the normal are velocity dependent. The patient was allowed to run at her own self-selected running speed, which was about 2.3 uh, meters per second, whereas the normal kids that were running at their self-selected running speed was a full kilometer faster at 3.3 meters per second. So some of the changes that you're going to see are velocity dependent. The magnitudes are going to be a little bit higher in the normals, and they're going to happen a little bit quicker. But it's good enough for comparison purposes. So if I zoom in now, the gray band, normal range of motion, shows rapid dorsiflexion during the stance portion, uh, or uh, the absorption portion of stance, followed by a rapid plantar flexion in the uh, stance phase generation. In the shoes only condition, again the red and the green, you see excessive dorsiflexion occurring right through stance phase. If you look at the moments, gray band being normal, you see a very brief and minimal dorsiflexor moment that quickly changes to a strong plantar flexor moment. And in the shoes only condition, there's a marginal uh, moment generated. Going to the powers, gray band being again normal, you'll see that there's a period of absorption followed by a very strong period of generation. And the magnitude of that generation is directly linked to how fast that person is running and obviously the energetics of forward propulsion. In the shoes only condition, you see again a very poor power profile, which like in walking is largely due to the fact that it's a flail joint. So, if we contrast that now to running in the ESR condition, you, I can tell you that the EMG activity is really not significantly any different, but there are some pretty dramatic changes that you're going to see at the ankle moments and powers. The plantar flexor moment peaks increase from 15% in the shoes only condition up to 80% of normal in the ESR condition, and the power peaks jump from 7% in the shoes only condition to a, a whopping 71% in the ESR conditions. And this, I just want to point out, is significantly better than what we saw when we were looking in the walking conditions. And these are very close to prosthetic studies using the sprint flex or the cheetah leg that I showed earlier. And if you want to remember one slide in this presentation, this is it, because there is nothing that will drive home the importance of stiffness with controlled motion in an ESR, AFO, resulting in a better running profile. I just want to touch on the knee in the running condition. The knee plays a much larger role in normal running. 22% of the positive work done is attributed to the knee, whereas in walking it's only 4%. The range of motion profiles are similar, but have greater amplitudes, and the moment and power profiles begin to look more like an ankle than a knee, with the exception of the absorption at the end of swing phase. So if I show you the shoes only condition, you can see that the knee profiles were similar to normal, but it was exaggerated and delayed extensor moment in the second half of stance. And similarly with the power plots, you'll see that exaggerated and delayed power generation occurring in the second half of stance in the shoes only condition. Contrast that to what you see in running with the ESR AFOs, and you'll see an improved knee profiles again. The knee moment magnitudes are now within normal, and occurring a little bit closer to when they should for a normal running pattern. 